Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ramley John. I'm excited to share with you a project that I've been working on. It's actually a book. Uh, it's called Trustworthy, Building a, a Credibility in an Age of Digital Distraction. So I'm actually writing this with one of my trusted friends. His name's Ali. Uh, just a little bit about me before I go on talking about this. I'm actually a math major from Waterloo, 2008. Right now, uh, I, I started off as a developer and then I switched over to growth marketing. So I help companies acquire and retain users. And I'm also an upcoming digital, digital marketing instructor at Red Academy, so pretty excited about that. Ali, who's co-writing this with me, he's a, a McGill comp sci major in 2005. He's right now like a design lead at the design, uh, Red Labs Design and Manual Life, based out of Community Tech. He couldn't make it today because the travel to from Marley to here is just crazy. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> they need to fix that. Before I go on, let me ask you this question. How many of you would be willing to ride in a car without a steering wheel? All right, that's crazy. All right. <laughs> a lot of people uh, would, I guess uh, this is a different kind of group. <laughs> it's very interesting about technology. For me, I, I would be I would be more questioning. This is obviously the Google car in California, but if you think about it, there, there's a lot. If you if you dissect what you, your thought process, you might you're probably thinking first of all, what's the benefits? Obviously, you can get to your location faster. Maybe you don't have to worry about driving. You don't have to worry about traffic. And we all know traffic in Toronto is terrible if you drive. But on the other hand, the risks are if this doesn't work even once. You can die in a horribly fiery death in QW or DVP. So you're putting a lot of trust in the technology that Google is building. You're putting a lot of trust in their algorithms. And even if it just fails once, right? The first experience might be great. The second experience might be great. And the third experience, you get into an accident. Then you start to question yourself, would I get back inside a car without a steering wheel? Now, this is an extreme case, but Traditionally, marketers and people see trust as an acquisition engine. It's a way to acquire users, whether it's through word of mouth or your friends telling you, hey, download this app, or maybe through, uh, through user reviews where you go to Amazon, check out this, this, uh, this product on Amazon, or maybe through testimonials. But I see it differently. What we, our thesis is that it's actually much further than that. That trust, as Amy Cuddy, she's a professor at Harvard said in this TED talk, is that trust is a conduit of influence. It's the medium through which ideas travel. That's what trust is. And essentially, when you build a product, when you build something like this, you are, you are, it's a medium for you to convey an idea or a value to whoever's gonna use that. Let me explain to you what I mean by this. If you look at it this way, users of your app or, or product they have a need, they, they have an, a pain, they have an annoyance, they have a curiosity, they have some kind of boredom. And your app or your product is making a promise to them. The promise whether it save, it save you time or save you money, or in this case to entertain you or to deliver an experience. And the user is essentially putting their trust that you will deliver that promise repeatedly over and over again consistently. Now, that's why I, I see trust, not just the top of the funnel, as you, uh, if there's any marketers here, but it's actually the whole funnel. So if you look at it, trust plays into user finding you. So if, for example, the Google car, you find it, you trust Google, you trust the brand, and then the user's first experience, you get into the car, it gets you to where you need to go. And your retention, so you use the car multiple times, it, it consistently delivers the value that you were expecting it to. If it, it, and then trust also plays in you telling other people, hey, you know, this is great. I didn't have to steer my car. It got me to where I needed to go. And obviously, if you trust that, that product enough, you would pay for it. And that's why, here's another example of where trust plays. How, how many of you use Amazon Prime? I, I love their Amazon Prime. And they, they make it clear what their promise is in their website. Their promise is to deliver uh, free two-day shipping from for from Amazon Prime for your shopping problems are solved. Unlimited deliveries. 
So that's why, you know, they, they've repeatedly delivered that promise to me. When I order my protein powder from them, I get it the next day or less than two days. When I order my iPhone charger, I get it consistently. So because of that, because of the trust I have for them, I keep going back to Amazon Prime. And that's why, like, this is uh, what a marketer said, is that every contact we have, every contact as a product, as an app, every contact we have with a customer influences whether or not they'll come back. We have to be great every time or we'll lose them. And that's what I'm trying to say is that every interaction a user has with your app or with your product, it either builds trust or destroys trust. And that, that's the reason why they might come back or they might not. That's the essential thesis of what I've been working on. Uh, I'd like to share with you two examples where it was obviously that we, they lost user, they lost me as a user because they broke the trust with me. So just two examples. The first example I have is with Apple Maps and Google Maps. How many of you use Google Maps? How many of you use Apple Maps? Be proud, man. Don't be shy. It's okay. How many? It's okay. It's okay, bro. I'm not gonna boo you. How many of you use Waze? Any other apps? That's cool. I love Waze. Well, when Apple Maps came out, it was in uh, 2012. It was terrible. Google Maps came out first in 2008, but in 2012, Apple was like, man, we're done with Google. You're stealing our data. We're going to create our own maps. So they created their own maps, and this was like the year after Steve Jobs passed away. So they released this app, and it was just terrible. There were stories where uh, somebody in the UK was looking for a hospital, and Apple Maps brought them to Burger King. And here's a story, here's another example where this guy was looking for Berlin and it, it ended up in Antarctica, of all places. Because if you, if, you if you look at maps, they have a promise. Like I, like I said earlier, every, every app, every product has a promise. My, and implicitly, a map's promise is they will get you to your location accurately quickly and safely, right? getting you to your location, wherever you enter your location. And a, an example I have here is, in, so it's been five years since this happened, 2012, when this was released. So I thought it, they would have, Apple would have fixed it, right? <laughs> they, fix, they fixed it, obviously. So last November, my church had a retreat in uh, Cambridge. So it was like an hour and a half away. And I rented this car that had this, it's called CarPlay where it uses my Apple Maps as the navigation system. So I was like, okay, cool, it's cool, it's fine. You know, they fixed it, they fixed everything, that's great. So I entered the address, he gave me this location. This is an hour and a half away from Toronto, that's fine. It can't, can't be that bad, can't be, you know, Apple Maps, they fixed it. As I'm getting to the location, it says, you're here. And I'm like, what? I'm here, I'm in the middle of nowhere, man. Come on, Apple Maps. I was like, seriously, Apple Maps? So I'm like, I'm literally freaking out of my mind because in the middle of the dark, I've like just recently like watched Van Helsing, which is a vampire show. <laughs> so I'm like, man, vampires are chasing, they're ready to kill me down or, or whatever. So I open up my Google Maps and it, it brought me here. It's like a different location. And it was off by three, three kilometers. It was, imagine that that was th two months ago that this happened. Now, that, that's one great example of why I've lost trust with Apple Maps. Like, literally, after that happened, every time I pulled up Apple Maps, I had Google Maps right beside it. So, like, hey, is it really going the right way? This is like a really extreme case where like, it lost my trust, and I'm definitely not going to go back to Apple Maps because of this. But, you know, there's been great experiences of that. Uh, that's one of the examples. The second exa example that I have where tr trust is broken for me was uh, Super Mario Run. I, I actually love this game. Uh, I love, no, let me face that. I love Super Mario. Right? So, uh, I really grew up with Super Mario. It was released last month and it was at the heels of Pokemon Go, right? People, people don't know that they're actually built by different companies, but People don't know that, so they think, oh, it's built by the same company. So they look into it. How many of you played Pokemon Go? They got into the hype. It was really, 
Pokemon Go was actually one of the fastest revenue generating app to reach $500 million, right? Within 60 days, Google Pokemon Go made $500 million. It's beat all the other games like Candy Crush, uh, Puzzles and Dragons, and Clash of Clans. And if you look at these four games, if you look at them, all of them are free to play. What that means is that you can play the whole game without paying any cent or any dollars, but you can pay like a few dollars or five dollars to not ninety-nine dollars to buy Pokeballs or upgrade something. So that's that's been the trend with mobile gaming. Right? And I thought it would be the same thing because I didn't read anything. So I see Super Mario Run, it's number one on the top chart of the free, right? Keywords free. So I downloaded it, it didn't say anything. It didn't say anything, hey, you know, it's gonna be fine. Uh, it's gonna be the same thing, I can play everything and you're probably gonna pay for like, I don't know, for stars or, or, or mushrooms, whatever that is. <laughs> so I, I, man, I'm so excited, I'm playing this game, it reminds me back of my childhood. You know, my, my childhood playing with Super Mario and the NES and like, me beating up my brother when I was young, right? And it just brought back his memory. It's like after five, ten minutes, I finished three stages and it brought me this image. $13.99. I'm not sure if you know this. Five, five minutes of three levels and after that, you, you're, I, I, got, I get this image. $13.99 for a game, which is crazy compared to the other one, which is between 99 cents. In, even Minecraft is like seven bucks compared to this which is the second one song of the game. The, the problem was like, I didn't, they, Nintendo did release a press release, right? A month before Super Mario Run, they released press release saying it's, it's gonna be thirteen ninety nine. but who has time to read news, right? I didn't, I didn't read this, I didn't know that it was gonna be thirteen ninety nine. And so because of that, a lot of reviews were terrible. Their ratings uh, averaged like 2.12, and there were some, there's some really like uncivil re reviews out there. The most civil that I've read is to hear from Bloomberg, which said this, a $10, this is in US, a $10 upfront cost to unlock the games is a huge ask and one that flies in the face of current mobile games being free to play. The first three levels are not very long and the payment screen doesn't seem to make it abundantly clear what the user is getting in return. What I'm trying to say is like, they weren't very transparent and because of that, they lost a lot of people's trust. They didn't just lose the user's trust, they actually also lost uh, shareholders' trust. If you can see here, within the first six days of the release of Super Mario Run, the, the stock price of Nintendo actually dropped 14.3%. Now, compare that to Pokemon Go, which like, even though they didn't make it, which is crazy, right? They, they invested in this company called Niantic, and they still gain like traction of 51% increase in stock price because of this, this move. So this is the, the second example which shows like really like trust plays more than just like the, the top of the funnel acquiring users. So I'd just like, just like to wrap up with like three lessons from this talk. Like every contact that, that we have with a user as, a, as product developers, as product builders, either really, it either destroys trust or build trust, right? Every it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's the first experience, the second experience, or the nth experience. It really does. You have to see it that way that you can either destroy or build trust. The second thing is always be aware of consequences of being wrong, and we saw this with Apple Maps. And the third is be honest and, and transparent. So it's all uh, talk. You can if you have any questions, I can answer them now, or you can send me an email. Um, you can sign up for the, the mailing list. We're releasing the, the, the book like later this year, so pretty excited about that. Thank you. So I know there's, a, there's, there's this magic number um, of positive experiences to make up for a negative experience. I've seen it as high as 12 and as low as five. Like if you, if you give somebody a positive experience, uh, pardon me, if you give somebody a negative experience, you have to give them N positive experiences to make up for it. Have you read anything that's at those bounds or anywhere in between? That's actually fascinating. That's like something that I was talking to Ali about where like it's it's almost like a bank. Like you have a each user has a bank and they're either withdrawing trust or, or depositing trust into that bank. I haven't seen the exact number, 
but it's fascinating if if you do find it, like I need to look for you. <laughs> the Google design methodology yeah. is any feature that would be a friction point, a negative feature, you need to overcome it with three positive features. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I'm going to check that out. Thanks. Yeah. Does your book cover practical tips on to, uh, how to implement uh, you know, um, maybe user flows or features that build trust in specifically mobile apps? Yeah, for sure. I we're really in the early stage, so anything you, you say right now, I will say yes to. So like, I need to talk. I need to talk to you. Right? If just any like literally any any suggestion, I think that's a good idea. Keep <laughs> <laughs> calm. Yeah. So. Hey, so have you seen the uh, South Park take on premium gaming? No, I haven't seen. I haven't you seen. You have that. to watch it. Okay, I'll. <laughs> it's actually a pretty uh, serious explanation of what pre premium gaming is. I'll check that out. Yeah. All right, so which do you think is a more serious, a serious betrayal of trust? If that's a Mario run, costs $13 if you want to play it. If you buy it, though, you still can't use it unless you have an internet. That's true. Yeah. That would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, if you, actually, if you actually go for it, and then you find yeah. out, oh, yeah. the one time I play games on the subway, one of the interesting things about this is like uh, users build an emotional bond with uh, with an with an app or an idea, and th I think the closer the bond is, the 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 angrier the pe the people will be, right? With Apple Maps, it's like oh that's that's cool, let's go. Cool. Okay, I'm, I'll pull up my Google Maps. But like Super Mario is so, like it brings back like nostalgia and memories of childhood, and for somebody to ruin that. Like it, it, it would be like a travesty for, for some users, yeah. and you can see the reviews. They were very not nice. <laughs> they were not nice. Yeah. All right. That's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.